Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, EduServe webinar. Uh, we're just going to waste a few minutes uh, for some more attendees to join, uh, but I will speak with you soon. So good morning. Um, my name is Julian Digby. I'm a solutions consultant at EduServe and welcome to this uh, EduServe webinar uh, on the public cloud's role in the digital charity of the future. So I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm a solutions consultant at EduServe and my role here is, is uh, twofold really. Um, firstly, I, I work with our customers to understand their routes to cloud adoption. Uh, in its many forms. Um, but I also work on the design of cloud solutions to meet customers' uh, requirements um, once they're further down the line and they're, they're actually actively adopting cloud solutions. Um, so this morning, I want to talk you through how the public cloud can help uh, the third sector uh, progress towards the, the, the digital charity of the future. So our agenda this morning, um, just three areas really. Um, what does the public cloud offer you? Um, what would the steps to adoption look like? Um, what could they look like? Um, and I've got some case studies at the end uh, to, to uh, demonstrate how public cloud has helped different organizations uh, with particular business problems that they have. So I thought it was worth asking a, a very fundamental question. Um, what is cloud? Now, if you go to Wikipedia, which I, I do frequently, uh, I think this definition is clearly the work of a committee. It has uh, many words in it uh, and is not particularly helpful. Um, the next definition um, is a bit more pithy um, and a bit more blunt, and it has some truth to it. Probably still not that helpful. Um, but what I think is a helpful definition is one that actually lists the uh, potential benefits of the cloud uh, to you, the customer. So enterprise class, secure, scalable, resilient, agile infrastructure and services with global reach and available, available on a pay-as-you-go model. Um, that, in a nutshell, is what the public cloud provides you. Uh, but let's break this down a little bit and look at each one of these in, uh, uh, in isolation. So enterprise class. So previously, if you were a small organization with, with uh, little funding, your ICT would most likely be in the budget price bracket. Um, public cloud uh, democratizes enterprise class ICT to some extent, um, and it gives all customers of any size access to state-of-the-art infrastructure without costly upfront infrastructure. Uh, in terms of security, the public cloud is secure. Uh, it's been the targets of hackers for many years, and public cloud providers have been able to test their defenses 24-7 against the most skilled attackers. They, they are one of the, uh, the most uh, attacked uh, set of platforms uh, that are on the internet. Uh, and they obviously attract a lot of uh, interest. Um, multiple layers of security are provided, uh, and if you configure them correctly, uh, you can certainly match or exceed the security that you would achieve in an on-premise data center. The 
the graphic here illustrates uh, just three certifications. Um, public health providers actively um, adopt certifications from uh, many different uh, countries and territories. Um, these three here are probably most relevant to um, to UK-based organisations. Um, and it's notable that we do quite a bit of work with the public sector um, government organisations, um, and they are absolutely happy to store uh, government protectively marked uh, data in the public cloud, uh, obviously with the, the right designs and services, uh, security services in place. So taking a look at scalability. So this is a, a major benefit of the public cloud. So where your demands on services vary greatly, uh, and one example would be online donation web applications, uh, customers can bring additional servers online as and when needed and remove them when they're not needed anymore. You only pay for what you use and there are no costs incurred for underutilized infrastructure um, that you have to purchase in order to deal with peaks in demand. So as the graphic illustrates, you can change your uh, the servers allocated to a particular task um, on a daily basis. You can also change it on an hourly basis. Um, you know, you can do this in response to metrics where, you know, processor load or number of incoming requests exceed a certain uh, level. You can bring up new servers to deal with that uh, demand. Um, but you can also, if you if you know when your peak periods are, so if they're on a Thursday afternoon or uh, Saturday morning, you can spin up new servers uh, ready for those peaks uh, on a regular basis, just on a, uh, a scheduled basis. Um, so resilience. Um, larger organizations will typically deploy their systems in multiple data centers uh, to cope with uh, possible failure of a single data center. Um, this requires investment in multiple facilities and infrastructure that is largely unused until a failure occurs. Um, so you end up spending money on equipment that you really hope you're, you're not actually going to have to use. Um, with the public cloud, first of all, it gives you the ability to uh, have a multi-data center solution without that massive investment uh, in a pay-as-you-go model. And it really makes it available to organizations of all sizes. Uh, even if you're protecting a single server, you can protect that with uh, by deploying it in multiple data centers. So your users stay happy with their smiley faces, even if you lose a data center. Uh, and it's worth stating as well that, that for organizations large and small, that um, secondary infrastructure is largely costing you nothing until the time when you have to use it. Uh, there's some proprietary work that you have to do to make sure that you can spin up the resources needed in a disaster, but uh, the servers themselves will not be running, will effectively not exist until you declare a disaster. And that's the point where you start paying. So global reach. Now this might not be uh, relevant to all customers, um, organizations that are, are solely operating within the UK, it may not be such an issue. Um, but it is true to say that the public cloud gives you access to data centers all over the world. Um, and it is very simple to access those services. Um, now, you might have uh, a fundraising organization uh, within the UK, but you might have global operations and you may need to support users uh, who may be members of staff uh, in far-flung areas of the world. The public cloud gives you the ability to, to serve them from local data centers um, without, um, uh, without having to invest in those, those territories yourself. Um, so this slide illustrates um, a set of data centers from one cloud provider um, deploying uh, ICT in Australia with this model is as easy as deploying it in the UK. The experience is absolutely the same. Uh, just because the data center is down the road or on the other side of the world, you really don't notice the difference. Um, and the great thing is there's just no investment required. You could spin up a server in every one of these territories today uh, for just a few pounds and you know provide global services of any scale to anybody. So that's a, a key benefit of the public cloud. So SAS or IaaS, so there's some 
uh, jargon here. Uh, there are two major flavors of public cloud. There, there are more flavors, but there are two major ones. Uh, infrastructure as a service, which gets called IaaS, and software as a service, which is referred to as SaaS. Um, with IaaS, you'll, you deploy servers, storage, and networking in the cloud to support your applications. Um, examples are Microsoft Azure platform, Amazon Web Services, and Google Cloud. With software as a service, you purchase a cloud-based application and have all infrastructure built, operated, and managed by a third party. And examples here would be Microsoft Office 365, uh, Salesforce, um, CRM, Google Gmail. Um, so which is the better fit? Well, a mixed economy is, is advisable. That's quite often the case. Um, the majority of most organizations ICT supports a common set of business activities. So as illustrated here, um, things like payroll, HR, accounts, email, timesheets, CRM, their website. Um, these are all things that most organizations have in some shape or form. The work that differentiates uh, your organization uh, and, and defines what it is you are and what you do uh, is typically supported by a smaller subset of your ICT. So when looking at cloud solutions, um, those common business applications are, are, are ripe for software as a service. So off the shelf web-based applications that deliver uh, the business processes that you need. Uh, whereas for your key differentiating activities, uh, it's quite likely that specialist or, or bespoke applications are gonna be required. Um, and those are, are more likely to be hosted in uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, but you know, could could equally be uh, specialist SaaS at the same time. So it's worth looking at um, what else uh, the cloud can provide, especially for for your bespoke applications. So when it comes to bespoke development, public cloud provides many building blocks that can be utilised uh, to build advanced applications with a, a great user experience, uh, particularly in the mobile arena. One great example is the ability to use social networking logons um, for your uh, fundraising uh, applications. Uh, users appreciate not having to uh, uh, set up and manage a new set of uh, user credentials. Um, and as an example, Microsoft's Azure platform has ready to use integrations uh, with these social network accounts uh, that are pre-configured for optimum security and usability. Um, so, these and, and other building blocks uh, connected with building um, uh, web applications and, and, and apps for, for mobile platforms on device, uh, diverse devices. So uh, Apple, iOS, Android devices, Windows phone devices, et cetera. Um, these are, are the building blocks that are available in, in public cloud to, to help your bespoke development. So moving on to what a uh, public cloud uh, adoption could look like. Um, so we suggest that uh, developing a strategy coupled with a, a roadmap of, of scope of about one to two years is a good place to start. So understanding what it is you're setting out to achieve um, over that medium term period. And once the strategy is in place, uh, planning individual projects aligned with that strategy and, and, and executing these uh, can easily follow on. So we we summarize this as strategize, plan, act. Um, and it can be a simple, um, you know, to use the, the jargon waterfall approach where you, you you do your strategy across your entire estate to start off with and then uh, gradually plan and execute uh, uh, a change or transformation of each element of your ICT. Um, but it can also happen in a more agile way so that you can look at isolated elements of your ICT, um, a formulated strategy, uh, and then obviously plan and act. Uh, transformation as you go. So when, you, um, when you're formulating your strategy, um, where should you focus your strategy? So it can be difficult to look at your existing RCT estate and, and know where, where to focus. Um, one way that we uh, think this can be eased is, is by focusing on your line of business applications. So those that support the core business activities that you undertake. So it's helpful to, to go through the list of systems and classify them as either line of business or supporting service. So line of business would be uh, your website, uh, fundraising applications, um, uh, any operational uh, 
uh, applications that, that you use. Um, supporting services can be many and varied, and, and in some organisations we've dealt with are, are vastly, you know, have, have far more servers than um, than the actual line of business applications. So here we'd include Active Directory, Backup, uh, VPN, File Share, um, uh, Direct Access. Um, things that deal with antivirus and monitoring and, and just general feeding and watering of your ICT services. Uh, so we'd recommend that you, you focus on your line of business applications um, and that will help you make decisions about, uh, for example, software as a service versus bespoke or specialist applications. Uh, and it will also allow you to uh, uh, align um, those applications uh, with your business processes and priorities. Um, and drive your strategy from the perspective of uh, business processes. So in terms of um, taking a, a, a smooth journey to the cloud, one area that is worth considering um, is um, the assessment of risk. So as with new or, uh, all new ICT developments, um, security assessment is advised, uh, but do this upfront. Um, delay to this can, can occur uh, if objections on, on the grounds of security are raised late in the day. Um, so with a properly documented set of risks and appropriate mitigations uh, that is accepted and signed off by the organization, uh, a smoother adoption of cloud services can be achieved without compromising on security. So where I've worked with customers, uh, it's been quite common where they've uh, had an initial uh, initial foray into the cloud. Um, people within the organization will fall into multiple camps and, and quite often uh, there will be naysayers to some extent uh, who focus on uh, a, uh, a, a subjective uh, reduction in security in the public cloud. Now, I think a lot of this comes from the fact that um, it just feels more comfortable if the people looking after your ICT are people that you know, people who you, you speak to and you, you know their faces and, and you know they're part of your team and, and pulling uh, in the same direction as you. Um, but actually, in, in the case of uh, the public cloud, uh, the anonymity of the people looking after your ICT is actually part of the security. Um, so, for example, in Amazon Web Services, um, they assign people to look after the uh, uh, the, the security of systems um, who, who, who basically don't mix with each other. So if you're um, if you have access to a data center and, and all these public cloud platforms are quite secretive about exactly where their uh, data centers are and getting access to them is, is, is nigh on impossible. Um, but if your job is to, to uh, visit those data centers and, and uh, maintain that equipment, you have absolutely no knowledge of what is installed on the servers and who it belongs to and what it does. Um, and anybody who does know uh, which customer's uh, data is, is held on the system is not able to actually uh, identify precisely which servers that sits on. Um, so because there's obscurity there, you know, in a, in a perhaps uh, un unlikely event that somebody decided they wanted to go and steal a, a disk out of a database server that they know belong to a specific customer, they would find it very difficult to get the A, the access and B, the information required to actually identify the right disk. Um, so so those kind of uh, um, obscurity of, of staffing can actually uh, deliver uh, improved security. Um, the graphic here is just a um, a, a risk matrix is probably familiar to some of you. Um, scaling, uh, 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 measuring risk on, on the basis of likelihood and severity, and combining those two um, parameters to, to come up with a, an overall um, uh, risk assessment. Um, focusing on those that, that come out in, in the red high risk uh, areas. Um, it allows you to then focus on, on mitigation and actually describe what it is about the way you're going to use the public cloud or the way the public cloud platform is built uh, that actually mitigates against the, the identified risks. And like I say, doing this early doors and getting broad agreement across the organization really does help remove um, any inertia um, around this area. And that's not to say that there, 
you know, there aren't going to be cases where it's felt that the risk of going to the cloud uh, is, is too great. Um, but those would be well defined and documented and would only be, you know, only have the scope of those particular services and it would leave you to, uh, to migrate uh, or consider migrating other services uh, to the public cloud without uh, concerns about security. Um, I really, I think when it comes to strategy, we would counsel that the move to the cloud is a matter of when and not if. Um, so I say that recognizing that timescales can clearly vary. Um, so it might be a long-term move to the cloud, but it's important to realize that organizations born in the cloud don't have uh, legacy on-premise ICT to contend with and will have a natural advantage in terms of agility. So moving towards the cloud will help you keep pace with emerging organizations. Uh, in what I think is it's fair to say is a competitive world of fundraising. Um, fund, um, donors have a, a choice of, of which charities to, to donate to. Uh, and those that uh, um, uh, get their message uh, out to uh, uh, more people more effectively uh, are likely to do better uh, in that arena. So moving on to some case studies. Um, so I have three case studies that illustrate how different elements of the public cloud have helped different uh, not-for-profit organizations. Um, so Just Giving, uh, so Just Giving had a, a requirement for a large-scale analytics platform, uh, looking at how their uh, fundraising activities and, and uh, their, their uh, ability to, um, to uh, uh, get in front of uh, donors, um, it, how, how well they're doing there. Um, but this analytics platform didn't need to be in use 24 by 7. Um, so using services from Amazon Web Services has allowed them to utilize much greater level of compute power uh, to perform their analysis much faster, uh, but with reduced cost overall. Um, so they only have to deploy this large scale system as and when they need it. Um, and when they're not using it, they don't pay for it. Um, so that pay-as-you-go model, um, a key feature of the public cloud, um, is what really delivers low cost. Uh, it allows you to, to live like kings one day uh, and uh, as paupers, if that's the right phrase, uh, at other times. But essentially, you know, it gives you, even the smallest organization, access to the most immense scale of, of compute capability. Um, and literally, if you use it for a a few minutes or a few hours, you know, you're looking at pounds to do this. Um, Comet Relief. So Comet Relief have the textbook business problem that's resolved by scalability in the public cloud. Um, as you might imagine, a large proportion of their funds are raised on a single evening. Um, and the ICT systems need to scale out significantly to handle that load. So you can see from the graph here, um, Donations per minute peak at uh, 10,000, which is approximately 300 donations a second, um, which is you know uh, a pretty uh, immense amount of uh, compute power required to keep pace with that. So previously, they've had to have a much greater investment in ICT systems to handle that peak load, uh, and were probably limited in, in what they could actually uh, uh, handle by what they could afford to spend on the ICT. Um, and also that peak load meant that for most much of the time, uh, the services that they had in place uh, were, were idle or certainly underutilized. Um, so that scalability of the public cloud um, you know, really does help uh, uh, cost reduce um, the approach to dealing with, with very peaky workloads. Um, uh, you know, other examples would be charities that uh, deal with um, uh, uh, raising money uh, following a, a disaster event somewhere in the world gets a lot of publicity and people want to donate and you want your donation platform to be able to accept those donations uh, uh, effectively. Um, that's an area where you would set a trigger um, that uh, you know if, um, incoming requests uh, for your website exceed a certain threshold that you spin up another server to deal with those. Um, so that would be based on a trigger. In Comrade Relief's case, they know that that evening is going to be a peak period and they can plan that ahead. Um, and actually, because they know it's going to happen, they can probably get access to, to cheaper uh, servers and, and, and compute resources because they're able to buy them ahead um, and uh, 
you know, it's a, it's a, a cheaper market for them to operate in. And the final um, case study uh, just illustrates how, how business processes can be improved using public cloud. So the National Trust um, have been able to take advantage of the public cloud for their operational activities. So data collection connected with managing and safeguarding properties was previously done by collating a, a disparate set of spreadsheets that were filled in by their staff as they visited properties. And the trust were able to take advantage of the development building blocks and, and SaaS solutions within Microsoft's cloud platform and uh, quickly develop a solution uh, that helped them uh, vastly improve this, uh, this part of their business processes. Um, so timely access to key insights for the trust has been vastly improved. Um, it only took eight weeks to uh, to develop the apps, um, and now they receive data uh, live, effectively from their uh, their property visits, um, and the people back at head office are able to analyse that data um, immediately uh, and get the best uh, business insight to 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 what's uh, required in terms of upkeep of those properties. So those are the case studies, and with that, uh, that's a wrap for the presentation. Um, if you had any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Thank you. So I've just been asked to remind you that you can submit questions in the question panel on the left-hand side of your webinar screen. Right-hand side, I think, actually. <laughs> it's on my left. Nothing coming through at present. I'll give it another couple of minutes. Okay, so we're we're not getting any questions there. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, I hope it's uh, been useful and provided some insight. Um, and please join us again for another webinar in the future. Thanks very much.